In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I welcome you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, in this year of our Lord 2020, on this fourth day of November, to reflect upon the writings and the substance contained therein of the servant of God, Luisa Picareta. Now, we are living in a time of the United States nation's history in which the outcome of the election will determine naturally the future of the country, but not just the country, the world and also the earth. Do you know that this planet of ours depends upon the children of this generation more than any other? This is revealed in Louise's writings many times. And we therefore have an obligation not only to love one another as Christ compels us to do, but to pray for those in office, both the Pope and the President. St. Paul alluded to this in yesterday's reading. If you went to Mass yesterday or followed it on TV, if there is still a lockdown in your area, St. Paul says that we are to obey all magistrates and civil authorities. Now, of course, obedience, as I mentioned in previous programs, is not blind. It is not a heteronomy. Obedience is informed, which means if someone in authority, be it ecclesiastical or civil, should ask of you to do something that is morally wrong, you don't do it. Why? Because obedience follows a chain of command. Obedience begins first and foremost to God. It's lent to God, rendered to God. And then, without violating your obedience to God, you lend it, render it to the Supreme Pontiff, and then to the bishops in union with him, and then to the ordinandi appointed by the bishops to preach and teach and administer, and to civil authorities, beginning with the president. And then, of course, those branches that our Constitution acknowledges as essential for not only ratifying or enacting laws, but for passing bills and amending, if necessary, certain articles. Now, we are to pray for these civil and ecclesiastical authorities. One of the beautiful works that brings this out is the dialogue, a work written by the saint of Italy that has more parallels than any other saint with Luisa Picaretta, namely Catherine of Siena. Saint Catherine, like Luisa, was of a first grade education, had the invisible stigmata, was a third order Dominican, experienced spiritual marriage, was given a ring, and in fact, they were both virgins. And also during her, that is Luisa's, spiritual marriage on earth, St. Catherine of Siena was present. And in my opinion, like Catherine of Siena, I believe that Luisa Picaretta will be declared patroness of Italy and possibly patroness of Europe. Now in these times where we are awaiting the outcome of the election, there is quite a bit of turmoil in both fora, both the civil forum and the ecclesiastical forum. Why? 
because of certain statements that were issued in recent times. Oh, I'm simply reiterating what is in the press. I'm not trying to you know, push any agenda here. I'm simply just contextualizing the talk of today by introducing the situation in which we live. And recently, Archbishop Gomez of Los Angeles, as well as the USCCB, put out a statement acknowledging President-elect, not President-certified, President-elect Biden to as, you know, representative of our country and civil authority. Now, certain ecclesiastics have taken exception to this statement, saying that it is premature. The votes have not all been tallied. The ballots are still being counted. So why welcome, greet a person who is... It's not hidden knowledge, it's notorious public knowledge, pro-abortion. And of course, you know, there are other things to add to that resume, but that's not the point of my talk. And people have been a little bit startled by these decisions, and also more recently by Pope Francis, congratulating also President-elect Biden. Now, are these ecclesiastics wrong? Some people say they are, some people say they aren't. In and of itself, acknowledging a present president-elect is not wrong in and of itself because it is assumed that the election is valid. However, it's an assumption. Is it wrong to make that assumption? Not if it's addressing him as president-elect, not president-certified. If it was president-certified, then it would be wrong, because that's not the case. He's not yet certified as president. But it's a custom that has been going on in the States for quite some time, and they're simply following this custom. Now, personally, I would never back a pro-abortion candidate, but that's me, I'm a priest. Because to me, abortion is the number one issue among all the issues in choosing a candidate. To some people, it's not. But to me, as a priest ordained to defend life, it is. And Luisa Picaretta, who always was attentive, of course, not so much in her earlier years, where the Lord would have to occasionally reprimand her, educate her, form her, lead her, sanctify her, but in her later years, and always obedient to the will of God. She would always pray for God so that sins against his will, in particular sins of killing, even abortion would come to an end. In her writing, she speaks of this sin that really cries out for God's wrath. And Mother Teresa of Calcutta, whom I had met, had the pleasure of meeting twice and spoken to, she said that the fruit of abortion is war. Now, what do we do in these times what we do is what Louisa did, and that is focus on cultivating the virtues that God had reared her to master, and then be open to welcome the divine virtues that come directly from God's divine will. But in order to do this, what we need to cultivate first and foremost, in my opinion, apart from, of course, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, is equanimity. Equanimity is the virtue that allows Jesus to operate in the soul without interruption, so as to form of it a portent of grace. So I'll share with you an episode in Louisa's 13th volume where Jesus wanted to see if Louisa possessed the virtue of equanimity. 
Now, equanimity is a balance, an interior balance of all the virtues. And she relates on February 2nd, 1922. This morning, my ever-beloved Jesus came, full of sweetness and goodness. He was carrying about his neck a rope with an instrument in his hand. As if wanting to do something, he removed the rope from his neck and put it around mine. He then fixed the instrument at the center of my body. And with a diameter, which he rotated from a little wheel that was in the center of that instrument, he measured me all over to see whether he would find all the parts of my body equal. He was absorbed in attention to see if the diameter that he rotated should find in me perfect equanimity. And as he found that it did, he heaved a great sigh of happiness, saying, Had I not found in her equanimity, I could not accomplish in her what I want. At any cost, I am determined to make of her a portent of grace. I was amazed, though I don't know what the instrument was, Louisa continues. I simply understood that. In order for Jesus to operate within us, it requires the greatest equanimity in all things. Otherwise, his will operates in one part of our soul while we destroy his work in another part. Imbalanced things are always annoying to work with and effective. Should one wish to set an object on an imbalanced surface, there is the risk that the uneven surface may cause that object to fall to the ground. Likewise, the soul, who does not always possess equanimity, one when who, who one day wants to do good and to bear everything, but another day is indolent and impatient, to such a soul one cannot entrust anything. Now, I wish to emphasize this virtue in particular because we are being put to the test in these end times. To the point in which one day we may be willing to give ourselves to God unconditionally and then the next day say, well, you know, my resolution is not as fervent as it was the other day because I have problems to deal with that demand my first attention. Now, to avoid these vacillations of the human will, God invites us to foster, nourish, cultivate the virtue of equanimity. Equanimity makes the soul reliable and dependable so that Jesus may entrust it with greater things. Okay? Now, <clears throat> among the other virtues that are worth noting, as I mentioned, are the theological virtues. Now, these are important in today's time because they keep us on the straight and narrow which we will soon be forced to face to walk, be forced to walk and have to face. In addressing the theological virtue, as I mentioned earlier, of faith, hope, and love, let's consider, for example, love, which is also known as charity. St. Thomas Aquinas considers love our devotion to God and charity, our service to our neighbor. Some authors use them synonymously, both love and charity. But Louisa affirms that unless there is growth in the virtues, sanctity will appear little if, will bear little if any lasting, lasting fruit. I'm going to share with you a passage from Louisa's writings here, taken from volume four. October 29th, 1900. She writes, What is most essential and necessary for the soul is love. If there is not love, the soul experiences what those families or kingdoms experience that are bereft of rulers. Some intend to do one thing while others are intent on doing something else. Thus everything is in disorder. 
the most beautiful things are obscured and there is no harmony. Such is the soul in whom love does not reign. Everything is in disorder. And the most beautiful virtues do not harmonize. And this is why love is called the queen of the virtues, because she has dominion and order, and she disposes everything. Now, whenever we act, the first thing that God would like us to do is form our intention with love, that is, to serve him with love. And if we should miss the mark and do something we don't intend to do, or perhaps we set out to do something out of love for God, but in the process lose focus of him and become angry, impatient, whatever the defect may be we incur, God still sees that our intention is to please him. Never lose sight of that. Certainly God wants us to meet and hit the mark. So if we intend to do something out of love, we ought to do it with love. But because we're imperfect, sometimes we fail in the process. And God understands that. But my point is this. The first thing we ought to do whenever we set out to do anything, even if it's a prevenient act every morning, meditating upon our Lord's passion, going throughout creation, glorifying God in and through all things, serving our neighbor, visiting the sick, going to the hospital, going to the cemetery, even the most mundane things as sweeping and eating and cleaning, paying our bills. We ought to begin these with love for love of God and through God, love of our neighbor. And in exercising love toward neighbor, we exercise the good <clears throat> and give God honor and glory. And this good is the grace God bestows upon us every second of every minute. And love must be exercised, as St. John says in the Gospel, toward our neighbor, that is, vicariously. Well, Louisa emphasizes this in volume 23. In volume four, on July, I'm sorry, in volume four, July 23, 1901, when she relates, this is true love, to deny oneself in order to give life to others, to take upon oneself the evil of others, and to give God one's own possessions. So love can be exercised on behalf of the deceased in purgatory or of the living on earth by taking upon oneself the consequences of the sins of others. And in speaking of love and the theological virtues, Louisa states that these three virtues, faith, hope, and love, conceal the three persons of the Trinity and constitute the foundation of all other virtues. She relates in volume one, while my soul was immersed in the immense sea of hope, my beloved Jesus came back and spoke to me about love, telling me, faith and hope give way to love. And love unites the other two virtues in such a way that they become one while they remain three. Oh, my spouse, this is how the trinity of the divine persons is concealed in the three theological virtues. So in her writings, Louisa affirms that of these three distinct yet inseparable theological virtues that conceal the trinity, Love is the greatest. And it is in this sense that the theological virtues emerge as the Trinity's personification in the soul, as it were, and the soul's relation to the three divine persons. Now, this is, these virtues, in particular faith, hope, love, equanimity, these are the virtues we ought to be focusing on cultivating in these tumultuous times in which we live and that we are about to face. As you all know, 
Joe Biden's um, team has already issued a statement. They they plan on a total U.S. lockdown. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to speak a favor or against the situation. I'm simply saying that is going to be trying for us because nobody likes a lockdown. And it can actually hurt families, finances, businesses. In the last lockdown we had, which only endured a few months, there were hundreds of suicides in the U.S. and throughout the world. So people are definitely you know, affected by it in such a way that doctors have come out and said that they consider lockdowns doing more harm than good, considering all the effects, positive and negative. In any event, the virtues are the things we ought to be focusing on. And now, how do we cultivate the virtues? God tells Catherine of Siena that every virtue is increased by its contrary. That is, that a virtue can only grow in opposition to its resisting force. Patience can only grow by confronting an impatient situation. Love can only grow by confronting hate or evil or sin. And when there is no opposing force, the virtue remains stagnant. So the virtues depend upon him, specifically, our neighbor, through whom these opposing forces come. Sometimes situations caused by our neighbor as well can enable the virtues to grow. Because events sometimes can be challenging, trying, like lockdowns, right? So we should avail ourselves of these situations, is what I'm trying to say, for the good of our souls and for the good of others, using a trying situation for a positive outcome. No, it's not easy, nor was it, nor is it supposed to be. The purpose, and we all know this, of our existence on earth is to love God with faith and hope, to serve him with faith, hope, and love, and to be happy with him in this life and in the next. But we have to pass the test of keeping the faith, just like the angels had to pass the test of serving the will of God, namely, that the second person of the Trinity should assume not an angelic but a human nature, just as Adam and Eve had to pass the test of obeying the will of God, namely, that they should partake of all, any fruit they so desired, of all the trees of Eden except one fruit of one tree, which contained the knowledge not only of good, but also of evil. Or like the test of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who was asked by God to give her will to him, not just one day, but every day of her life, unconditionally. So we are asked to pass a test. And it's not supposed to be easy. It wasn't easy for Mary. It wasn't easy for Adam and Eve. And it wasn't easy for the angels. But those that did pass the test among the angels, and like Mary, and like those who keep the faith to the end, who live on earth, will inherit heaven because we have to prove our loyalty to God. And this is the way we do it, by serving him with faith, hope, and love in this life so that we can also reign with him in the next. Now, the measure the soul mortifies its passions and grows in the virtues, in that measure grace in the soul increases in degrees and enables the divine will to reign within it. Remember what Louisa said, God cannot do anything with a soul that is imbalanced, who one day wants to serve him unconditionally with its will, but then the next day takes a moral vacation. So the virtues keep us from going back and forth or up and down. 
to keep us in that state of immutability, always resolute in doing and wanting to do the will of God, even if it should cost us our own life. In her writings, Louisa states that a firm resolution is when one is willing to die rather than deliberately offend God. Now, that's pretty resolute, if you ask me. But that's the kind of ironclad resolve that God is looking for in each and every one of us in order to impart to us not just part of his will, but the fullness of his will. And Louisa did not attain to this center, this fullness of his will, until she was 35. At 33, she experienced the spiritual marriage on earth, and 24, the spiritual marriage in heaven. But she still had to yet attain to that center of the divine will. And she was only able to attain it by having that ironclad resolve, never to turn back, but to always, with equanimity, without interruption, every morning, day and night, be open to do his will and to do it whenever he asked her to in specific conditions, whether it was to endure a certain sacrifice or a fast or a penance. And we are asked likewise to mortify our own senses and passions from time to time as well. And this is why the Blessed Virgin Mary at Medjugorje asks us twice a week to offer up sacrifice. On Wednesday and Friday, and she said that prayer and fasting can suspend natural laws and avert war. Never let us, we should never underestimate the power of prayer and never let ourselves not apply mortification to our passions and senses from time to time. St. Padre Pio said, the body is like an ass. Now, where did that expression come from? It came from St. Francis of Assisi. He used to call his body Brother Ass. Now, Ass is the animal, of course. But Padre Pio added that you must be careful not to mortify it too much, beat it too much, otherwise it will collapse. I don't think that's a problem in the Western world, by the way. But nonetheless, there has to be a balance in all things, right? Now, with this halfway mark, I wish to remind you of the importance of continuing to support Radio Maria. Because it depends upon your generosity, your prayers, your financial support, as this is commercial free and 100% listener supported. So please continue to enable us to continue to bring you good, sound, Catholic doctrine on current events in the church and on programming that relates to the betterment of your family, your own Christian education, and the upbringing of your children. For Jesus to reign in the soul, the soul must correspond to God's grace that enables it to empty itself through the cultivations of the virtues. Now, let me emphasize a few virtues here that Louisa gave more importance to than others in her writings. Humility. This is a big virtue for Louisa. And Jesus emphasizes this virtue a lot. Detachment. Trust in God, distrust of oneself and one's own opinions, and peace. These are important virtues. Now, peace is of particular importance today because whenever there are trying situations, be it for our families or our nation, the first thing that the devil wants to take from us is peace under the guise of being active of being proactive. But we should never lose our peace, no matter what. Jesus tells this to Louisa multiple times. For example, in volume 11, May 16th, 
1909, now November 2nd, Volume 4, 1900, and so forth. Peace ought to never be forfeited no matter what. Even if there is conflict. And this is why Jesus, when he walked through the cynical doors on Mercy Sunday, said to the apostles, Peace, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he said again, Peace be with you. But he also says in the gospel, I did not to come to bring peace, but division, to bring the sword. He was not contradicting himself here. What he was saying is that there is peace even in conflict, even in turmoil around us, even in division. There's always peace. But divine, not human peace. So in the gospel, he was speaking about human peace, peace between human beings. He did not come to bring this. When he walked through the cynical doors, he was speaking of divine peace. That he came to bring. And that is what we reiterate before we receive communion every Sunday. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. This is what the priest says before he distributes the communion. The words of Christ. And that's because... God is a God of peace. And in order to bring that divine peace in our world, sometimes he has to tear down walls of human pride, human prejudice, human ego. And this is where the human peace falls apart. Rightly so. So that divine peace can take its place. And this is why Christ came to bring a sword. What is the sword? It's his word, St. Paul tells us that. God's word is a sword, a double-edged sword. And that's peace. Because it tears down evil and it supplants it with divine love, faith, and hope. It transforms a pagan and secularized and materialistic world into a believing, faith-filled, loving world. Among the other virtues Louisa addresses, worthy of mention, as I touched upon earlier, are the divine virtues. Now, these are virtues that we don't find in our catechism. The expression Louisa uses to describe the virtues the soul acquires in the divine will are divine virtues. The expression is divine virtues. Take, for example, volume 16, March 19th, 1924, where on the Feast of St. Joseph, Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, I bless your heart, your heartbeats, your affections, your words, your thoughts, and even your tiniest movements, so that through my blessing all of them may be invested with divine virtue. By this means, as you accomplish your acts in my will, by virtue of my blessing, they will bear this divine virtue within them and have the power to diffuse themselves in all things, to give themselves to everyone and to multiply me in each and everything. Thus you will give me the love and glory as if all possessed my life within themselves. Therefore, unite your thoughts, your words, your heartbeats, your pains, in some, your whole being with the motion of my will. Spare nothing of your interior, so that with my will's passport of light, accompanied by divine, my divine virtue, you will enter into each act of every creature and multiply my life within each one of them. Oh, how happy I will be in seeing by virtue of my will, the soul filling heaven and earth with as many lives of mine as there are creatures. Now, if you listen attentively to that passage, it gives you an insight into what the divine virtues are. Jesus tells her that by virtue of his divine virtues in her, 
she is able to enter into each act of every creature and multiply his life within each one of them. The, hum the Christian virtues don't do that. This is why we don't find these virtues in the Catechism. It's a new outpouring of grace. These are the virtues that the angels possess. These are the virtues that Adam and Eve possessed before sin that have been suspended up until they were reactualized in the human nature of Luisa Picaretta as the first creature conceived in sin. Certainly they were possessed by Jesus and Mary, who knew no sin. But now they are being extended to each and every one of us, these divine virtues. When have you ever read, for example, in the lives of the saints, that they were able to enter into each act of every creature and multiply God's life within each one of them. Truth is, nowhere is this found in any of the writings of the saints in the past. Because with the gift of the divine will comes this outpouring of grace, namely, his divine virtues. And Louisa presents the divine virtues as emanations from the most holy trinity of light inaccessible to the created mind that vary in intensity and impact the lives of all creatures in heaven, in purgatory, and on earth. And she says that some rays that descend from God's inaccessible light invest in rapture and delight creatures while other rays contain such divine qualities as the beauty and bliss of God's divinely revealed truths, which serve to enliven, preserve, and purge creatures. Now, to get the full flavor of this, I will share with you this passage in full. Okay? On, in volume 13, on January 14, 1922, Louisa relates, I found myself outside of my body, and I saw that the heavens had opened, and a light issued forth that is inaccessible to any creature. Rays descended from within this light that invested all the creatures in heaven, in purgatory, and on earth. Some rays were so dazzling that, while being invested, enraptured, and delighted by them, such creatures could not at all describe what they contained. However, the power of the light was so great that I myself did not know whether my little mind would ever be capable of going back into my body. If my Jesus had not shaken me with his words, no human force could have pulled me back from that light to call me back to life. But alas! I am still unworthy of my dear heavenly homeland. My unworthiness forces me to wander in exile, but oh, how hard it is. Then Jesus told me, My daughter, let us return together to your bed. What you see is the most holy trinity, holding, as it were, all creatures in the palm of its hand. And as the Trinity gives life and preserves, purges, and rejoices with its mere breath, there is no creature that does not depend upon its operation. Its light is inaccessible to the created mind. And if anyone wanted to enter into this light, it would experience what a person who wanted to enter into a great fire experiences. Not having sufficient heat and power to face this fire, it would consume him. He would never be able to express how much or what kind of heat the fire contained. Now the rays are the divine virtues. Some virtues are less adaptable than others to the created mind. This is why the created mind sees them and delights in them. But it is unable to describe what they contain. If the other virtues which are more adaptable to the human mind may be described, they are expressed in stammers. 
as no one can effectively express them in such a way that they are completely and worthily understood. And these virtues that are more adaptable to the human mind are love, mercy, goodness, beauty, justice, and knowledge. Therefore, let us together, you and I, offer our homage to the Most Holy Trinity in the name of all, to thank God, to praise Him, and bless Him for the many blessings He showers upon all creatures. So this passage on the divine virtues coming from the Trinity like light from above, as sunlight rays, bring with them God's eternal operation. And it is only by God's eternal operation that the human creature in receiving it is able to operate eternally in, that is, go into the past, present, and future, impacting all acts of all creatures. The creature is incapable of doing this, but it is God's operation in the creature that is capable of doing it. So the creature does nothing other than dispose itself to receive passively this eternal operation of the three divine persons. And with its intention and firm resolution to remain always in that light, that inaccessible light that produces this eternal operation, impacts all creatures of all time. However, the creature doesn't know exactly what is going on. It gives its fiat to God, and God is the one who administers, diffuses, and multiplies these rays of light in and through all creatures, these divine virtues of God that go from God to the angels, to human beings, and back to the throne of God, bringing with them the interest of other human beings because these acts are multiplied by God in and through human beings, in particular through the human being's will that works in concert with its intellect and memory, of course. But we are unable to describe what is occurring because all this is happening in the invisible immaterial order to which our finite bodies and faculties do not have access. We may have glimmers or moments of access to these invisible realities, but not always. When we go to communion or confession, do we always see what's going on in the invisible world? No. Sometimes we may have lights, they call them, in spiritual literature. That is, insights by the grace of God into what's going on. Or we call them mystical visions. But on the rare, this occurs with most people. More common, most people do not experience these consolations of seeing what's going on. And that's all because we are journeying in this world in faith. We're not supposed to see everything now. That's the whole purpose. It's not supposed to be easy. We are put here to serve God with love and joy, but also in the face of trial. And that is why Jesus told the apostles, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. And that is why he also said to this, his heavenly father in prayer, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that they may, may not be of the world. And God is asking us to walk a very fine balance, a tightrope, as it were. And we can do it by ourselves. But with him, we can do not just this tightrope walk, but we can do much, much more. Because we are not relying upon our own resources, but upon God. As St. Teresa of Avila once said, without God, we can do nothing, but with him, we can do everything. So, 
in attributing to God's light specific life-giving properties that enliven creatures, Louisa establishes a correlation between divine light and the divine virtues. With the former, divine light communicating to the latter divine virtues, the two human creatures. And she describes the divine virtues as continuous, a continuous sublimation in God's one eternal operation. Of the Christian virtues, the soul has assimilated in its Christian journey. Otherwise put, God absorbs everything that we've cultivated in our Christian journey by virtue of his infusion in us of the divine virtues. These divine virtues touch, penetrate, and elevate the Christian moral virtues and the Christian theological virtues and the Christian cardinal virtues. They bring them to a whole new level because they now can impact all things of all time. Louisa, therefore, illustrates this truth as follows. As the soul nourishes its life with, and I'm quoting from, I'll be quoting from some of her volumes here. The first volume I'm quoting for from is from volume 15, May 2nd, 1923. The second volume is from um, volume 23, October 10th, 1927. The next uh, volume 33, March 11th, 1934. And the last volume 16, March 19th, 1924, which I shared with you already. To summarize this, Louisa affirms that as the soul nourishes itself with the bread of Jesus' will, that's a quotation taken from her volume, by repeating its acts in his divine will, it forgives like Jesus, who absorbs into his will all the soul's virtues, where they receive, that is, the virtues of the soul receive, the seal of true heroism and of the divine virtues, which arrive at the most heroic and divine degree. By this means, the soul concurs in Jesus' own acts, bilocates in all things, and influences the lives of all human creatures. And Jesus reveals to Louisa the manner in which he brings the soul to share in his divine virtues. As God's divine will proceeds and is inseparable from his divine love, like light that proceeds and is inseparable from its heat, so the soul of the human being on earth who seeks to live in his will must allow the divine will to absorb it so that it may elevate that is, the divine will may elevate its virtues to the most heroic degree and divine, the most heroic and divine degree. This is from September 28, 1921, volume 13. <clears throat> and the soul, after it allows the divine will to absorb its virtues and elevate these virtues by giving its fiat to God, that God may operate within its memory, its intellect, its will. The soul then in turn absorbs and consummates within itself the divinity's acts in creation, redemption, and sanctification that God brought about forth with divine love, and it grows in the life of the divine will. Now this teaching comes from volume 25, October 28, 1928 where Jesus tells Louisa, in everything that was accomplished by the divinity in creation, redemption, and sanctification, this has not yet been absorbed by the soul. Let me repeat that. My daughter, everything that was accomplished by the divinity in creation, redemption, and sanctification has not yet been absorbed by the soul, as everything remains within my divinity awaiting its actualization in souls.
Now, in order for the kingdom of our divine will to reign among souls, the soul must absorb within itself all of the acts that the divinity accomplished for love of souls, and so absorb them that it encloses within itself everything my fiat possesses, internalizing them and cons consummating them within itself. Thus, my divine will consummated within the soul will actualize this whole divine army of divine acts in mankind. Let me repeat that. Thus, my divine will consummated within the soul will actualize this whole divine army of divine acts in mankind. All of our acts in creation, redemption, and sanctification that we issued forth for love of souls will find their actualization in souls. And my divine will actualized and consummated in them will triumph, reign, and dominate along with our divine army. Now that was like a long run-on sentence by Louisa. Remember, Louisa was not an author, so she wrote as things came to her by revelation. So the purpose of this program in part is to break down into simple prose what she's trying to say. And that is that we must allow God, through his eternal operation in our intellect, memory, and will, the three faculties of our soul, to absorb all the virtues we exercise from morning till evening. And in so doing, God renders them uninterrupted by virtue of the infusion of his own divine virtues in our human Christian virtues that we exercise every day. And this infusion on the part of God of his divine virtues in our finite human and Christian virtues renders them uninterrupted and multiplies them by the virtue of God's own divine power in all created things to our unawares. We don't see where our acts are going. Neither did Louisa. And this is why they are acts of faith. But we, with trust, give our will, intellect, and memory to God so that he may possess them. And once we have done that, then we in turn, that is our soul, in particular our intellect, memory, and will, absorbs the divinity's acts of creation, redemption, and sanctification within itself. That is everything the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit did, is doing, and ever will do. Because this is what God wants to do in us. He wants to fuse within our voids, in our soul, his entire activity. Well, that's enough for today, my brothers and sisters in Christ. May God bless, may God bless you and keep you in his most holy will. Till the next week when we uh, revisit the writings of Luisa Picaretta. May God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>